my name is Jane Jenkins. I'm the director of the Science and Technology Studies program here at uh, St. Thomas University, and I'd like to welcome you to the STS annual lecture this evening. Dr. Elliott received his PhD in the History and Philosophy of Science from the University of Notre Dame and is currently an associate professor at Lyman Briggs College, which is part of the, the uh, University State University system, home to the Michigan State Spartans basketball team. Uh, forecast just the other day by President Barack Obama to win the NCAA championship. Um, when, when Dr. Elliot is, is not embroiled in the basketball fever that must be hanging over that university campus, um, he studies the role of ethics and values in scientific research. He's the author of numerous articles, and the book is A Little Pollution Good for You. His talk tonight is Love Drugs, Cheating Genes, and the Ethics of Science Communication. Please join me in welcome Dr. Kevin Elliott. Um, so I also want to thank uh, Dr. Bronson for uh, inviting me and for uh, setting out this workshop this morning uh, throughout the day. And one of the things that struck me is um, that Dr. Bronson brought up first thing is the number of different disciplinary perspectives that came together and the number of disciplinary perspectives that I imagine might be here uh, tonight. And so um, I, I'm a little worried about the complexity and the challenges of you know, sort of addressing you know, some scientific folks and journalistic folks and STS folks. Um, so I'm hoping that I can uh, say things that are useful to a range of different people um, and not get any you know, disciplinary perspective too irritated with, uh, with what I have to say. So um, uh, what I'd like to do is um, uh, talk about a tension that I think science communicators face, whether it be scientists or journalists and so on. Um, between two sorts of norms. Uh, one is promoting objectivity, as came up earlier, and I know actually we've already discussed a little bit today, objectivity can be a tricky, almost dirty word sometimes in, in STS. So uh, for my STS crowd, um, don't get too turned out off by my use of this term, I'm not meaning it in a sort of, uh, sort of simple, value-free kind of way. Um, and I want to, um, so this involves a little bit of kind of abstract theory and philosophy and ethics and so on. And so uh, to keep things from getting too boring, I want to illustrate what I have to say with a case study involving um, bowls and sex and things like that that will hopefully liven things up. And, uh, and then I want to talk a little bit about uh, a potential solution to this tension that we face between objectivity and understanding. So. So uh, before I launch into things too much, I want to acknowledge it's too bad that my um, uh, friend Dan Coyne uh, can't be here. He's a philosopher at Boston College, and he and I have been working together on a lot of the ideas in this talk, so I want to be sure to, um, to give him credit. And he's actually the expert on my case study, so if you push me too hard in the question and answer uh, session, I will uh, refer you to his, some of his work. Um, but so we uh, wrote a letter uh, in science on some of these issues, and we co-authored another article on some of the things I'm talking about this evening. So uh, he should get the credit along with me for anything good that I say tonight. Um, so on to sort of this key dilemma or tension that I think is worth thinking about. So um, on one hand, uh, we tend to think that an important norm for scientists um, and for others communicating about science is to strive for some sort of objectivity to avoid putting too much of one's own spin, if you will, on the evidence. I think this is something that, even though from an STS perspective we might want to problematize the extent to which scientists can be sort of purely objective, there is the sense that you know, part of the goal of STS is to actually highlight the ways in which scientists may be bringing uh, particular values to the science and make that more transparent. Um, so we want to, on the one hand, have science communities strive for some sort of objectivity, um, but then we also want scientists and those communicating about science to serve society by providing useful information uh, that can help inform individual decisions and group decisions. And I want to highlight the ways in which sometimes these norms can, can come into tension. And I think a really nice way of illustrating this is in a debate that came up again in the journal Science a few years ago. Um, Matthew Nisbet and Chris Mooney, uh, who both deal a lot with issues involving science communication, um, 
published this uh, commentary piece called Framing Science. And a theme in this piece, they said that those communicating about science, whether they be scientists or others, should pay a lot more attention to how they're framing information. They gave examples of climate change and embryonic stem cell research and creation and evolution and intelligent design issues. And they said that scientists should be trying to sort of talk with social scientists and learning how to frame the information they're presenting in ways that will prevent the public from being so turned off by it. Um, and uh, in ways to sort of help people take it up um, better. Well, um, there were a series of letters um, that followed um, uh, under this sort of heading of the risks and advantages of framing science. And I just want to give you a sense of, of what played out. Um, so Matt is and Chris Mooney here. Um, one of the things they said is, you know, just from a social science perspective, people in, are just getting hit by a torrent of information. And so um, people have to find ways to pare down this complexity and figure out you know, what's important. Um, and in a sense, sort of put information into boxes that they can sort of understand you know, how to think about all this information they're getting hit with. Um, and they said frames can be really valuable for doing that. Um, and also, Dan Kahan, who's um, actually at Yale Law School, has done really interesting work on um, science communication. And uh, he's pointed out that Frames can actually, we often think of framing as kind of strategically sort of manipulating people into thinking about things a certain way. But he said actually frames can sometimes lessen this interpretation and make it more feasible for people to, to take in information because um, it can open people up to thinking about things in, in certain ways. Um, just a, a quick example. Um, say certain folks who would normally maybe be really skeptical of information about climate change, um, he's pointed out sometimes that can be because the information is, if one's coming from a more conservative political perspective, um, climate change can seem like it really sort of cuts against those, those values. And he said, but if sometimes, if climate change is framed in terms of ways in which, say, market um, uh, initiatives can, uh, you know, one can make money or move, you know, sort of economies forward addressing climate change. Um, sometimes that can make people actually more open to considering the others. So, um, so that's the kind of line that has been in Mooney were offering. Um, some of the others uh, in these letters responded though and said, well, framing seems to turn science into politics. And, um, and, and that may be unfortunate. We may be losing something if we do that. Um, or maybe this sort of undermines science's neutrality. Um, and so um, then science loses a lot of its credibility. So this is a kind of a sense I'm just giving you of the debate that, that played out here. Um, I also want to point out, besides just this debate about framing, um, I think that the same kind of tension between objectivity and understanding comes up in a lot of the other questions um, that, that people often discuss related to science communication or science policy. Um, there are questions that I hear a lot about. Um, how much should scientists be interpreting their findings for policymakers? Will they lose their objectivity if they do that? Um, another key issue, um, you know, I'm in this Department of Fisheries and Wildlife um, at Michigan State. And so a lot of the scientists there struggle with this question of, is it appropriate to engage in advocacy or to make recommendations to policymakers? There can seem to be really valuable aspects of scientists offering their perspective, but then the worry is, are they you know, losing their objectivity in some sense? Um, should scientists ever allow their ethical or political values to in influence their interpretation of evidence? Um, should they ever adjust their standards of evidence um, when they're making claims that could have major social ramifications. So there are just a whole host of questions that I think sort of in some ways are informed by this tension between this pull toward objectivity and this pull toward um, assisting society with understanding. Um, so um, I'd like to suggest that I, I don't think we should just completely um, sort of abandon one norm or the other. I think that both have valuable aspects to them. And so again here, I, I, just so that I don't uh, suddenly lose my STS crowd, you, you, you may be thinking, oh, why did Kelly you know, invite this darn philosopher of science who was all excited about objectivity? Um, let me just uh, clarify that um, I'm, I'm not thinking of objectivity as sort of a, a value freedom. I'm thinking of it more in terms of a, a transparency of where one's coming from. And so if you just really don't like that term, 
I actually think that my description here is very amenable to what STS is all about, that a lot of the, the momentum of the STS field comes from the worry that scientists may in some cases be taking too much decision-making power for themselves. They may be smuggling particular values into their work and that we actually want to sort of make those values more transparent and, uh, and visible. And so I think that, so you can either think of this that way or um, those of you coming from a more traditional conception of objectivity, I think can also sort of recognize this worry that maybe we don't want scientists sort of overly aggressively bringing their own values to the table you know, in their work. Um, so I, I do think that this is a goal or a norm that we shouldn't too quickly abandon um, whatever term we use for it. Um, but then I also think that promoting understanding uh, is important. Um, and uh, you know, the, the, the goal of, of saying, oh, we're just going to aim for a sort of objectivity. We want scientists to hold on to objectivity and, and not sort of interact with the public. Um, and try to keep the scientists being perfectly neutral, well, that can actually be just as likely to hide values um, as to eliminate them. So I think that can be dangerous. And um, it can end up resulting in poor societal decisions if scientists pull back from interacting with, with society. So I'd like to look for ways in which we can sort of actually respect both of these norms or values that we have. Okay. So uh, for those of you who have been thinking, yeah, this is getting a little theoretical and boring, here's our opportunity to, to talk about more interesting things for a few minutes. So this is a more concrete case study I'd like to use to illustrate um, what I'm talking about. So um, what's really interesting um, about this in scientific work is scientists have found some really interesting connections between um, a particular gene and sexual behavior among voles. These voles are these rodents. Um, you can see. Uh, little picture up here. Um, and the interesting thing is there are a, a variety of different species of voles. And uh, what they found is that this particular species of voles, prairie voles, are um, relatively monogamous compared to other species like montane and meadow voles. And by relatively monogamous, um, you know, one of the things I'm going to be pointing out later is it's easy to get confused about this. This isn't the way we think about monogamy among humans. Um, but by monogamy here, we're meaning these uh, voles will, will tend to develop a partner preference that they'll often return to the same individual um, to mate. They'll sometimes exhibit biparental care, both of them taking care of their offspring, and, um, and often huddling together, and so on. And what's really interesting is, so not only have scientists noticed this you know, behavioral um, feature of these different species, but then they found this interesting kind of molecular level connection where they found that prairie voles have more vasopressin receptors um, in their brains. And um, so vasopressin is um, a neuropeptide made up of, I think, nine amino acids. And um, vasopressin and oxytocin and some of these other neuropeptides are involved in um, sort of uh, mediating social behavior in various ways. Um, uh, I think that you know, in sort of lactation and in childbirth, oxytocin is really you know, highly present. Um, in mammals, and what they found is that um, you, so so these prairie voles have more receptors in their brains for this particular neuropeptide, vasopressin, and they found a particular um, uh, the, the the gene responsible for this and the difference in the vasopressin receptor gene in these prairie voles that differs from the other voles. And so then, what gets really interesting is they've been able to manipulate this. So. They can manipulate it, and they actually inserted the prairie bowl gene um, into the meadow voles, and they found that they were able to then get the meadow voles that were normally kind of indiscriminate in their mating to behave like the prairie voles and sort of have this bonding with a partner. So um, they had this neat experimental system that they used to, to examine this. So they'll have um, a couple of, of uh, voles mate, um, you see that on the top, and then they'll take their male um, and, and put the male prairie vole in the middle of this three-chamber compartment, and then they'll put the partner that the male mated with on one side, and then they'll put a stranger vole on the other side, and then they'll see, well, how often does this male hang out on his own in the middle? How often does he go hang out with you know, his previous partner, and how often does he hang out with this stranger? And um, so what you see on the left here is the prairie vole. So this is how often he 
um, after he did this mating, and then he was put in this uh, sort of uh, compartment. Uh, you see he's hanging out a lot with his partner. Um, he's hanging out a little bit on his own. And then this is the difference in the meeting with humans. If you know, the male were hanging around this often with some stranger, we wouldn't call this monogamy with, with humans. But with prairie voles, the idea is he really does prefer the, 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 the female prairie vole he was partnered with before to the stranger. And then you can see the montane voles. Um, you know, the montane, he just likes to hang out on his own, even after he's been with this, uh, this, this partner. And then he, um, there's not really a statistically significant difference um, in the amount of time he, he spends with his former partner versus the stranger. Um, so you notice the significant difference in behavior. Well, what's amazing is um, they've been able to then insert the prairie bowl gene into the meadow or montane bowls, and it actually shifts so that then the montane or meadow bowl acts much more like this, where suddenly they're exhibiting the significant partner preference. And so they can turn on this monogamy with this gene, and then they can actually turn it off by then blocking the vasopressin receptors. So it seems like this fascinating case of taking the social behavior and reducing it in some sense to this molecular level um, stuff. Um, so it's a fascinating body of research. And then what's really interesting is um, there's been some work in humans um, where um, uh, this is, I'm not sure exactly how to pronounce his name, Hassi Wallum or Wallum. Um, who did this really interesting study um, where they found associations between a particular version of a human vasopressin um, receptor gene and some pair bonding behavior in men. They um, gave some um, uh, psychological um, uh, um, surveys um, to, to um, couples looking at their perceived bonding with their partners and uh, perceived marital problems, and then just their marital status, whether they were married or, um, or single. And they found some statistically significant um, associations between um, the vasopressin receptor gene they had, and they actually found that the men who had two alleles of this particular gene were even much more strikingly likely to exhibit um, uh, statistically significant differences than those who just had one. So you have this difference between men who had neither of the alleles and one and then both. And um, they were finding these men with both alleles of this particular gene, um, especially were more likely to be single. They were more likely to have marital problems and so on. So, um, so you can imagine, um, we were hearing earlier today among the journalists, that um, the journalists need some interesting story. They need um, something to make uh, their, their work exciting. And you can imagine, this sounds exciting uh, for a journalist. And so what you found was um, you know, lots of discussion. This is where the title of my talk came, that you know, a cheating gene had been discovered, that um, you know, this came up you know, around Valentine's Day each year, wanting to discuss this, this research. And um, I just want to give you um, an example. Um, in this case, I, I didn't want to just use an example of a journalist doing wild and crazy things. So this is a, a medical doctor. Um, writing a column for uh, Psychology Today. Um, and uh, so she says, these are just a few quotations from her work, uh, referring to this work on the voles and then the work uh, with, with humans. Um, say, suggesting this research opens the door to medication to treat infidelity. Um, if infidelity is a genetic variant, uh, should physicians treat it like hypertension or diabetes? Um, she says, studies in prairie voles confirms my sense that we're all wired differently and hence we come into the world with a different interface. And um, perhaps, I like this, perhaps we could sum it up this way. Monogamy, one part family values, one part vasopressin responsiveness. So um, anyway, um, I'll, I'll refer to some other journalistic work on this uh, as well. But um, so lots of discussion about this is, uh, you know, we're, we're identifying a, a cheating gene. And then uh, you know, the other part of my title was the idea of love drugs. And um, there's also been some work with both vasopressin and this other neuropeptide, oxytocin, um, on the ways in which it could affect people's social behavior in terms of trust. And um, so here's a quotation from a book in which the authors said, um, spraying a captured city with a drug that would make its residents trust their new masters or make the insurgents throw roses at the new masters. Um, it may seem outlandish. Um, but in 2005, 
uh, they appealed to research uh, by these uh, Swiss researchers. Uh, they found the test subjects given a nasal spray of oxytocin, this other uh, um, neuropeptide, showed markedly increased trust in those with whom they were dealing in social situations. So there's the speculation that maybe we may be able to develop some sort of a love drug or a trust drug or something by further studying these, uh, these neuropeptides. So um, again, this is um, uh, work that I've done with Dan, and he's actually taken the lead in identifying these frames, but we try to, in terms of thinking about the issues surrounding communication in this case, uh, to think about some of the major frames. And um, you know, I'm not sure if, if all science communicators would, would want to you know, refer to these as frames, but there's certainly kinds of narratives or themes that one can see um, in a lot of the journalistic work on this. Um, so one is the, the theme of genetic determinism, of of thinking of a particular gene as being responsible for behavior. We saw um, in that Psychology Today uh, quotation um, the idea of infidelity as a genetic variant, and that we can find the infidelity gene. Another theme that comes up in a lot of these discussions is um, the idea of humans being like voles. And um, so, you know, again, you could see in the earlier quotation I made the idea that studies in prairie voles confirms my sense that we're all wired differently. Um, another theme that's somewhat similar to genetic determinism, but just in general in this literature, is the idea that we're, we're succeeding in a sort of reductionism. We're finding that these social behaviors, love and so on, can be reduced to certain um, you know, a biochemical chain of events. Young is one of the key scientists who's been doing work with these voles. Um, another theme that comes up in a lot of the, the public journalism and literature is the idea of saving relationships. That um, this, you, know, you saw in the previous quotation, the idea should physicians treat infidelity like um, hypertension or diabetes, that maybe doing this kind of research can, can enable us to save human relationships. And then finally, um, another theme, or, and this is actually in the literature on framing, Nisbet and, and Mooney and some of their work note that a really common frame um, is the worries of like sort of opening Pandora's box or you know, sort of dangers associated with technology development. Um, and so the, here you see worries about dangers of social manipulation. Um, uh, for, uh, in another spot in this book that I was referring to, um, they say warning signs have been present as the years have passed of this possibility of developing these, these trust drugs and trust agents, but they have fallen on deaf ears. So, so these are our common frames that Dan and I um, noticed in looking at this literature. And, um, and I think, again, one can see some, some pros and cons to these frames, actually. I mean, this goes back to my tension between objectivity and understanding. Um, but I think they can help when people are exposed to all kinds of information. Um, it can be helpful for people to be able to, to sort of have a way of making sense of, of this research. Um, but these can also be really um, misleading um, as well. And so, just to point out a couple ways in which um, you know, these frames on the previous slide are misleading, um, you know, there's of course the point that you know, developmental factors and social factors um, are extremely important in behavior. Not, you know, so obviously they're very important in humans, but even in voles, folks have pointed out that even the, among prairie voles, that they're very sensitive to social experience and so on. So one has to be really careful giving a sort of reductionism or genetic determinism. Brain. Um, and also, another really interesting point that Dan makes in some of his work is that they, this prairie bowl version of the mass suppressive receptor gene, so it seems like, hey, if you've got this version of the gene, it makes prairie voles act monogamous. And um, if you've got the other version of the gene in montane or meadow voles, it makes you promiscuous. But actually, there are other prairie bowl species that are non monogamous. Um, but they've got the, the prairie bowl version of the gene. So clearly, it's not some nice you know, one to one connection. You've got the gene and it makes you monogamous. Um, and it's also been difficult to replicate these results in other contexts. So, as you know, STS scholars would um, be good at pointing out, there's a lot of complexity and messiness here in the science that we need to um, acknowledge. So, um, let me turn now back a little bit to my philosophy and STS reflections, and then we'll return to the, to the bowls again. Um, toward the end. So um, something that Dan and I have suggested as a, a way of possibly thinking about how to navigate this tension between objectivity and understanding is the concept of backtracking. And um, 
So to backtrack, you know, of course, you know, we're all familiar is like is to go back over a path, to, to sort of return to some previous point. And so I think it's interesting in the context of science communication, um, you know, to think of a path as a metaphor for the interpretations or the values or the frames that are being applied to um, you know, an issue. And so by backtracking, you know, Dan and I are suggesting that um, there's value to try to make the recipients of information more aware of the interpretive path that has been taken. And I actually think that you know, in terms of thinking about you know, what STS can contribute to society and to people's educations, I think that STS is really good at, again, making values visible, highlighting the significance of interpretations and values and what's going on um, in science. So I think this is a real strength of the discipline. Now, um, I think there could be a wide variety of strategies that can contribute to backtracking. And I wanted to mention a range of strategies, some that are more appropriate to scientists, perhaps, some more appropriate to journalists, some to STS scholars or philosophers, and so on. So coming from a sort of scientist perspective, um, I think that there's value to trying to acknowledge the weaknesses of one's frames or one's interpretations, to be a little bit reflective about you know, what one's doing. And, but here again, um, it can be very helpful for others you know, from humanities or social science disciplines to sort of help the natural scientists identify potential weaknesses um, in their frames or interpretations, acknowledging alternative interpretations, um, differentiating stronger and weaker claims, um, Maybe, so to the scientists, you know, there's this trend toward um, seeking to make data publicly available. And I think there's a lot of complexity surrounding it in different contexts where it works better or worse than others. But this can be part of the broader picture, I think, of enabling greater scrutiny of uh, one's interpretations and so on. Um, I think that disclosing important interests and values is increasingly important. Um, Sort of, so there's a trend toward um, disclosing financial conflicts of interest in publications. And this was partly the realization that there tended to be a significant funding effect between um, who's funding research and the kinds of results that one was obtaining. But it doesn't just have to be financial interests. And here's where I think that there can be this sort of worry within the scientific community that if there's a, an acknowledgment of the fact that one has certain interests or value orientations, that then people won't trust what one's doing. But I think this is a complicated question. I don't have all the answers. But I actually think that when you look at the controversial issues we face nowadays, I think there's plenty of distrust of the scientific community that people don't sort of think, oh, the science is perfectly objective. And so actually, I think it could potentially create greater trust to acknowledge you know, interests and values that might play a role in where one's coming from. Um, and then, I'm thinking more about the science studies community and public engagement. I think creating venues for broad de deliberation about science can help to sort of make values and assumptions and important frames more visible. And I think this is a really also a valuable role for STS scholars, for activists, and so on, to say, you know, what you may be thinking of is pretty straightforward scientific information here. There are some really important assumptions that we need to backtrack from and think about um, the implications here of what's going on. So you may be able to help me think about some more um, strategies as well um, during our question and answer session. But these are a few ideas that Dan and I have been thinking about. Um, now, um, I want to acknowledge there are a host of objections that you could raise. And I may be being naive, but um, there are some ways in which um, s some initial uh, possibilities of my naivete that I'd like to try to um, uh, sort of respond to. So let me just toss out a few worries that you might have. Um, so one is um, the worry that this idea of trying to backtrack um, may run counter the whole point of framing. The whole idea of framing might be we're trying to simplify the message, and then I'm trying to suggest that we need to throw in all this you know, complexity, acknowledging the weaknesses of our frames and so on. Um, another worry might be um, that I'm being a naive philosopher of science, thinking that there's some neutral interpretation-free data that we can get back to, and we just need to backtrack to, the, to this you know, interpretation-free point. Um, another worry might be, this is too much to ask of scientists to try to get them to be thinking about backtracking, try to acknowledge the, the weaknesses of, of their interpretations, and so on. Um, another worry that is that you can't expect scientists or science communicators to be aware of their their frames and interpretations. 
Um, another worry might be the cat's already out of the bag. Once some communication has been done, there's really no hope for backtracking. Um, and so um, we're just kind of stuck with the initial frames. And then a final worry might be, look, you know, I'm a naive philosopher. Um, you know, we are hearing a little bit today about sort of the messiness of media and of the fact that you know, these poor um, journalists have to come up with these stories you know, at lightning speed, and they have to write these extremely quick stories. And you might say, even if you know, scientists and you know, STS scholars are trying to help us be more sophisticated and acknowledge caveats and uncertainties, this is just all going to get lost in the mess of media. So I want to respond to, there may very well be loads of other problems with what um, I'm saying, but I'd like to respond to each of these worries just to diffuse a few potential problems. Um, OK. So in response to the worry that, um, that um, so, so back to the first thing, does my proposal run counter the whole point of framing? It's the whole point we're trying to be a little bit more simple here with our messages. Um, I think that you know, part of you know, traditional conceptions of science that I think are, are good ones and of responsible inquiry in general require that at least we set up some ideal of acknowledging the sorts of you know, potentially controversial values that we're bringing to our work. Um, I think that's important, and, and even if it might complicate things, I don't think we should sort of fail to at least consider that as something worth shooting for if we can. Um, in response to the worry that um, I'm sort of holding up some naive notion of that we can backtrack to some neutral starting point, um, you don't need to presuppose that there's some neutral starting point that we're trying to backtrack to. All you need to acknowledge is that sometimes there may be interpretations or values that are being applied to this work that others would question and that maybe we should be more transparent about. That's all I'm trying to get to with this idea of the value and importance of, of backtracking. Um, and then in response to um, the worries, you know, are we asking too much of scientists? Can they really even understand and recognize the various ways in which they're bringing values to bear on their work and, and framing things? Um, well, this is, can be what part of what SDS is so valuable for. We don't have to sort of tell the scientists they have to do all this themselves. Um, you know, there are other disciplines that are trying to do this sort of thing, trying to point out the implicit assumptions and values and frames that go into scientific work. So that's a little plug for um, SDS. Um, and then, so, so the fifth worry I raised was the possibility that sort of that what I called the, the cat being out of the bag idea that once information has been framed in a particular way, you can't easily backtrack out of it. Um, and so here, I'm not sure if this is a perfect solution, but I'd like to sort of see what you folks think about this. Um, you may be familiar with Cass Sunstein. He's kind of a famous uh, law professor. He was at the University of Chicago for a long time, a buddy of Obama's. He was in the Obama administration recently, and now he's at Harvard Law School. He's a really prolific guy, um, and he wrote a book called Nudge with another University of Chicago professor. And um, in that book, they called for something called libertarian paternalism. And um, so the idea, if you're familiar with either of these two terms, it sounds really weird how you could bring these together. Because paternalism is the idea of we're trying to sort of you know, guide people into making good decisions. We're almost making decisions on behalf of other people. Whereas libertarianism is the idea that we want to give everybody freedom to do their own thing, and we're not going to tell them what to do. It's kind of a very, you know, sort of a right wing, you know, sort of get rid of government kind of perspective. Well, what they pointed out in their book is that there's all this interesting psychological research on the fact that our choices, what we think are these free choices, us making our own decisions, are really often steered by situational factors. So like one example is if you go into a cafeteria, depending on where the particular food items are placed, whether they're high or low, or at the beginning or the end of the line, people tend to be much more likely to choose particular foods depending on where you put them in front of them. And so what we think of is, well, I'm just choosing my lunch. Actually, um, you know, it's really influenced by these sorts of situational factors. And there's all kinds of interesting psychological research on this stuff. And so they say, Again, the point is that you know, we are not as free as we might think, that we're constantly influenced by framing, by our situations, and so on. And so they say, well, how should we respond to this? Well, they say that maybe what we ought to do is you know, if we're choosing, in some sense, how to steer people, we should try to steer them in directions that we think are beneficial, 
but we give them the freedom to opt out, you know, if they become aware of it and you know, they really want to. And so, um, so an example that they give in their book um, is the idea of um, people's retirement plans, that whatever their default retirement plan is, um, people tend to stick with it. And so they say the idea is, why not make the default a retirement plan that you think is good for people, and then you let them opt out if they want. But the idea is you just recognize that whatever you make the default is going to affect people's, people's decisions. So I'd like to kind of draw a comparison to these issues of framing um, and suggest that, well, if the way in which information is initially framed may not be totally eliminable, people are going to be influenced by how information is initially put to them, well, maybe we should be trying to work with the scientific community to provide initial frames that are socially responsible, that we think are appropriate. And again, I think that's a role for ethicists and philosophers and STS to sort of work with, with scientists on these issues. Okay, and then my last point, I thought, you know, a really fun, popular example of backtracking is the story of Hansel and Gretel, you know, where they, you know, uh, I can't remember all the details of the, of the fairy tale, but they basically you know, are taken off into the forest, and then Hansel leaves this trail of crumbs um, behind to sort of find the way back. And uh, so as far as this issue goes of, look, the messiness of the media context and so on, um, you might say you know, any efforts to try to sort of highlight uncertainties and, and clarify and acknowledge the weaknesses of interpretations it's just going to get lost when information is presented via the media. Well, one point I would make is, you know, even just offering a few crumbs, just a few hints of how to get back, um, can be really helpful in some cases. And so in the media context, we were talking earlier today, I was asking some of our journalism experts, um, they were talking about the difficulty of actually offering caveats um, and, uh, you know, in journalistic presentations. And I said, you know, do you have ideas for you know, how to, you know, to do more of this? And, and one of the journalists pointed out, well, I mean, one little step that can be taken is just to off, put in hot links to further information. And so you know, even little things like that, just offering people a clue to where they can find more information, so if they might want to interpret information differently or come to different conclusions, just you know, that in, in some ways, the proliferation of new social media and so on can offer people opportunities to investigate stuff for themselves. And so just giving people a few clues, they can do some of the backtracking themselves and say, I'm not sure if I trust the way this information is being interpreted and offered to me. Um, and the other point in the Hansel and Gretel story, at least as I understand it, in at least some versions of the story, uh, Hansel left uh, crumbs and then they got eaten up by the birds and they were trapped. So I guess the point would be, well, maybe sometimes you know, the, the, mess, the complexity of the message may get lost in the media context. But that doesn't mean one shouldn't try. Um, I think these are still useful norms to, to hold up. So you folks have been very patient. And uh, I'm down to the last section of my talk. And then we can have a, a group discussion. So I thought it might be nice to return back to the case of the voles and just see, again, how all this abstract backtracking stuff might apply to this case. OK. So um, the question is, you know, might we backtrack in the Bulls case? And um, so one thought is that um, you know, I was suggesting that sometimes one could acknowledge weaknesses in one's interpretations or cautionary notes. And so some frames, like the humans are like moles frame, I think that one can facilitate backtracking by making a few cautionary comments. Um, so again, this doesn't have to be super complex, but just noting a few caveats. So one point that can really be easily confused um, is when we're talking about monogamy and voles, it's easy to think, well, that's the same idea as but monogamy and humans. And as I noted early in the talk, you know, they're not the same. And when we think of human monogamy, we're thinking in terms of sexual exclusivity. We're just with one partner. Whereas in the voles, it's just a matter of partner preference. You're spending more time with one than the other. But you know, you may, this is not genetic exclusivity in the voles. And so just noting that point can do wonders, say, in journalistic presentations, I think, and so on. Um, so again, just back to my initial chart, the idea that the, uh, the prairie bulls are still spending plenty of time with, this, with the stranger, not just with their, their partner. And another one of the key scientists, I think some, the scientists are often already trying to do this sort of thing. Um, Tom Insel 
was um, a key early figure in this work. And he's acknowledged that you know, between different species, there are lots of differences in these neuropeptides. And so, um, you know, so we should really recognize the weaknesses of this humans are like bull's frame. This can be suggestive to humans, but there can be lots of differences in these species. Um, uh, similarly, I think that um, the genetic determinism frame, there are lots of ways in which one can clarify and help promote backtracking, as, as I put it here. And I would just note that philosophers of biology and STS scholars have, again, this is where I'm trying to promote the ways in which STS can help with these sorts of things. They help to highlight some of the weaknesses of this kind of frame. So um, you know, scholars have pointed out that you know, talking about genes for particular traits you know, are generally not all or nothing. It's a matter of probabilities and depends so much excuse me, on the environment. And uh, here, um, I don't want to bore you too much with this graph, but I do think this is really interesting. I remember the first time I saw this kind of graph, I just thought it was so enlightening. Um, the idea is, so here you have a particular phenotype, say it could be like monogamy, and here you have different environments along this axis that an organism might be in. And then each of these lines is supposed to represent a particular genotype. So you might have like a particular version of the vasopressin receptor gene. And so the whole idea <coughs> is, if you have an organism in one particular environment, well then, a particular gene might make you behave one way, whereas a different gene might make you behave the other way. But if you change the environment, well then all of a sudden that genotype that made you behave one way may actually make you behave in a very different way. And similarly, the other genotype may make you behave differently. So the idea is that one can, just by offering a few cautionary comments, again, this may be a slightly complicated concept, but scientists and other you know, science communicators can offer a few sort of clarifications, I think, sometimes, that you know, those in STS can help to, to highlight. Um, and then, if the media frenzies are just too crazy, um, if we're thinking in terms of backtracking, we might decide that some questionable frames should just be avoided or minimized, that it's just too hard to backtrack from them. And here again, I think that social scientists and STS scholars can help to highlight the fact that some frames may just be too socially problematic. Um, we might think this is the case for some of these genetic determinism frames, reductionism frames, saving relationships. And I just give some examples of why we might think these are problematic. So um, I was just hearing earlier today that um, I think one of our journalism experts was saying, you know, 80% of Americans or something like that, North Americans, um, you know, really trust the nightly news. And so um, this is unfortunate if you're listening to the NBC Nightly News with Brian Williams. And he says, throughout history, men have come up with all sorts of excuses for behaving badly. Now it appears they have a new one. It's in their genes, apparently. So you know, if, if this is the kind of message that you're going to get across socially, you may, as, a, you know, as science communicators, want to say, we better just really watch out about this kind of thing. Um, another woman on the NBC Today show, when she was talking about this kind of, uh, this was just a, a, a woman who was hearing about this kind of um, information. She says, well, I would want to have my mate tested, and I'm single, and that would secure my marriage. So again, this is the sort of, sort of, if this is the uptake that one's getting from these kinds of frames, one might want to say, these may not be very socially responsible frames to, to, to be working with. And, and again, uh, STS scholars can help to, to point that out. Um, and then, finally, I think at the very least, just helping to make science communicators aware of frames, like these five frames that Dan and I tried to point out. Um, I think that making people aware of those dominant frames and then thinking about different alternatives, um, once again, a shout out to the SDS community, can, can help with backtracking, making us more sophisticated about making values visible. So some folks have pointed out that you know so much of the journalistic treatment of this Bowles case has involved you know, sex and monogamy. But it's also possible that this could be relevant for autism, sorts of, and other aspects of you know, human interaction and so on. And so just sort of highlighting if one sort of recognizes, wow, there are real weaknesses to some of these frames and the way they're taken up in the, in the culture. And we might be able to have some alternative sorts of frames. Maybe there are some, some ways in which we should shift toward alternative frames in our communication. So um, all right, you all have survived my, my talk. Um, just to give you again the, the big highlights, 
So first is that you should give Dan half the credit or more for all these good ideas in here. Um, uh, the other theme is that, uh, you know, so I tried to highlight this, this way of, uh, of thinking about some of these issues, that there can be tensions between norms associated with objectivity um, and norms associated with assisting public understanding. And um, I suggested that maybe an interesting concept for helping us think about how to navigate this tension is this concept of backtracking. Um, that this can be a helpful goal for communicators and maybe for thinking about some of what STS is trying to do in terms of making values visible in, in science. And, um, and so if we apply this to the Bowles case, um, you know, again, some of the ways in which we might be able to promote this backtracking is to help scholars to acknowledge weaknesses, maybe to avoid certain kinds of frames and explore alternative ways of, of framing the information. So thank you all very much for coming out. And I'm just wondering what your position is. Isn't it better uh, on the idea of isn't it better for to have the science delivered by the by the author, by the scientist, warts and all, yeah. rather than having it polished yeah. or framed in that particular perspective? That's a wonderful question. I really appreciate it. And um, just offhand, I mean, one is um, some of these scholars who really focus on framing. Um, will point out that, um, that it's not as if you know, sort of current science um, is just sort of frame free, that they will talk about even the idea of science contributing to social progress um, as a kind of frame that, you know, so all the efforts to kind of get you know, money for scientific research, they would say that there are narratives sort of surrounding this kind of science, you know, that they talk in terms of economic progress or, you know, frame and so on. So I guess depending on how you think about frames, um, you could argue that even our best efforts at trying to avoid framing science, there are still sort of hidden ways in which we're sort of presenting it in, 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 in certain ways. So that might be one um, point. The other point would say would be when you talk about presenting the science sort of warts and all. Um, you know, this is part of Dan and my point about the backtracking. We would think of the sort of the warts and all as, as, as maybe as, as part of the backtracking, the idea that, you know, in some ways, if scientists just dump a bunch of data in front of anybody, you know, even fairly educated policymakers, they're just going to be sort of, you know, unsure what to make of it. Um, and so the thought is to the extent that the scientist, and, and feel free to disagree, I would really like to get further input, you know, it seems to us that, um, that, that to, to try to avoid all frames um, and all interpretation, the scientific information would end up being so difficult for others to make sense of that it really would, we would lose so much of the understanding that it would be a serious loss for society. And so the thought is, the scientists have to do some interpretation and help in guiding us in what to make of this stuff. And so if they're going to do that, well then we just need to acknowledge, we need to look for ways for, for them to sort of backtrack and acknowledge, hey, I've done some interpreting here, there are some other ways of thinking about this and so on. And um, maybe, I don't want to talk too long on this point, but I mean, I think in terms of climate change, you might say, you know, hey, is it a problem if for political reasons, you know, information is being framed in a certain way? But I think part of why that's so worrisome is that there's not backtracking going on. If somebody were saying, you know, look, hey, we're presenting a particular interpretation here, but this is kind of the overall sense of the scientific community on this issue, I don't think we would be so worried about it. So that's where I think that um, the, the backtracking, if it's done well, can do wonders for alleviating our worries about it. And I guess I'm wondering, sort of, um, uh, maybe I'm a little bit skeptical of coming up with a list of frames that, uh, that you know, we could agree upon. You know, I think we could agree. Um, and I guess I'm wondering, sort of, how you could th think about handling that. Because um, my sense is that, you know, you're kind of presenting this work to, to science communicators and and I'm wondering if you're getting any kind of pushback on it. Um, one was this idea that I'm kind of focusing on the sort of the tail end of science, if you will, you know, the communication of it. And I'm super sympathetic, um, and I've talked about this in, in other parts of my work, to the idea that we need to think about the ways in which values of various sorts influence all sorts of aspects of the research enterprise. You know, what questions get asked. This was actually a theme in my Is a Little Pollution Good for You book. Um, this was... Uh, um, 
there I was discussing research. Some scholars were suggesting that, that low levels of normally toxic uh, substances could be beneficial or, or stimulatory um, for the body. And um, so as you can imagine, there are all sorts of interesting political and financial aspects um, um, to this research. But so there I point out that you know, in terms of the, the types of questions that get asked, um, the kinds of um, uh, research methodologies that are used, um, in terms of uh, just the terms that are used. I suggested that some researchers have proposed a new term called hormesis for this idea of low-level beneficial effects. And I said, even just this choice of this new term, sort of saying, hey, we've discovered this new phenomenon called hormesis makes a significant difference as, a, as a, uh, um, compared to just saying, hey, there are a lot of weird things going on at, at low doses. And then in the interpretation and communication and so on. So I think you're absolutely right to point out that throughout the research enterprise there are these issues and, and again while I'm you know here to sort of you know make a plug for STS I think this is one of the really valuable things that that discipline and you know philosophy and history and related disciplines can do um, you know sort of highlighting these values so we can think a little bit better about them and this is part of I think what you know the value of public engagement exercises as I was talking with some of the folks about shale gas issues and so on you know as um, you know, research is being proposed on this issue, you know, there are really significant questions you know, about, you know, what kinds of questions are we going to ask about this? You know, what kinds of studies are we going to do? And in some ways, it's too late if, you know, a certain range of interests, you know, design all the studies and do all the research, and then at the end, you just say, okay, well, we need to now communicate th about this strategically. You know, a lot of the important values come early on. You know, who are the people involved in saying, how are we going to study this? What all are we going to look at in terms of impacts and so on? So, and, and in terms of methodologies, methodological assumptions. So, I'm, I'm really sympathetic to that point. Um, it also seemed like you were raising maybe the question at the end, I'm not sure, of um, maybe we're suspicious of certain frames like genetic determinism and so on, but it's not clear that everybody would be suspicious of those same frames. And so you can have differences in different societal groups, what frames they find reasonable or um, you know, ethically legitimate and so on. And there again, um, I think that, so I, I raise the idea of possibly avoiding certain frames you know, if it's just too messy to backtrack from them, if you will. But I think ideally one might hope that there could be more intelligent backtracking. And so um, we wouldn't be stuck just having to totally avoid certain frames, but we could sort of start with a particular frame, but highlight to people, hey, if you don't agree with my values, there are these other ways of thinking about the issue of looking at it. I'm not sure how well that always works out in practice, but sort of ideally, the, the philosophical hope would be you could sort of acknowledge your values and provide ways for others to then say, okay, well, I think I'm coming from a different value orientation. Here's where I might go with this scientific information and so on. So, um, so that one's not just having to choose and say, okay, this is the ethically right frame. This is what's going to be used. Anyway. I have a question. I'm wondering how that maybe um, butts heads with public expectations of, of scientists, right? Given the common sense view of what science is and what, sci and what the scientist is, right? Asking the scientist to foreground his or her values um, is often, you know, then the scientist is sort of flagged, especially among um, his or her fellow researchers as being an advocate, right? And um, that doesn't jive with the common sense view of science is completely value neutral. So it's almost like there has to be a widespread STS uh, education campaign on right on on you know understanding science in its social complexity before you you ask scientists to perform this kind of backtracking. Okay. So so I think it's actually a really interesting question that maybe I'm not well qualified to answer. That maybe we actually need more social science research and 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 scientists' experiences on this sort of thing. I do think so. There are some interesting anecdotal sorts of you know cases where. Um, so I, I'm teaching a class right now on money and science, and I'm working with a lot of students who are you know, pre-med students who are planning to go become physicians, and we were talking about the issues of physicians acknowledging, say, um, cases in which, um, say, they may be having patients involved in a drug study um, that they might have a financial interest in and so on, and there's at least some evidence 
that you know, so so based on everything I've read, I tend to be would be really freaked out actually about you know my physician being involved with this stuff because I hear about all these iffy things going on. But there's some evidence that that patients actually feel like, wow, my physician is so open and transparent with me. I have no problem being involved in this sort of you know study. You know, this is or or they actually feel like if say a biomedical researcher has a financial interest in some treatment, well then they must really care about, they'll want to do the science right, versus there are various cases we've read about in which it actually provides an incentive to sort of cut corners or to keep doing the study longer than perhaps they should have. So um, I, I guess I just say that, um, and I know those physician contexts are a little different than some of the science cases, but I think sometimes it can, um, it, it, it's not clear. It's hard to just say, sort of, from the armchair, you know, you know how you know acknowledging certain kinds of interests and values are going to affect the way people uptake information. It's possible if it's done well. Where, say, sometimes I'm also interested in the risk assessment literature, where you'll see people say little sort of off the cuff remarks like, you know, it makes sense to make these assumptions from a public health protective standpoint. And I kind of read that as this very subtle way of saying, hey, there are values here. We, we could make different assumptions, and we're making assumptions that are protective of public health. And so I guess I'm, I'm very sympathetic to your worry, but I'm not sure always how it would play out in practice if scientists said, look, you know, there's some uncertainty here. You know, here's sort of some of the information. And um, you know, look, I'm concerned about public health, and so I've tended to interpret um, some of these things in this particular way. I'm not sure if that would sort of destroy public trust. And in so many of these conflicts, it seems like the, what's actually happening, I just wrote um, an article coming out on um, debates about the European Commission's policy on endocrine disrupting chemicals. And um, to make a long story short, basically there's this draft report that was leaked from the European Commission. And certain um, high profile scientists thought that it was far too precautionary and so they wrote these scathing editorials um, in a number of, of journals. Um, and these were largely journal editors, prominent people, who said, you know, this is a terrible policy. And, and, and they use language like it's, it's ignorant of almost all um, established principles of toxicology and pharmacology. And then some opposing um, scientists came out with subsequent editorials and said, you know, this is, you know, the, 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 actually the European Commission's proposed policy is very reasonable, that it's not crazy at all. And then there were investigative reports later that the initial um, journal editors that came out saying the European Commission is crazy, um, of the 18 people, 17 out of the 18 had ties to industry and so on. And, and it just seems like when this all comes out later, it seems like people are already super suspicious and they're all figuring, yeah, there's probably some weird stuff going on here. Let's go find out what the financial ties are versus being more open initially um, I'm just not sure if it's necessarily going to be disastrous for scientists to be more forthcoming about some of these values, but it may depend on how they do it, what the context is, and I know in some areas, you know, you were talking about biology. I acknowledge, we were talking earlier today about the sciences and the differences between different areas. It may be that in some of the areas I'm looking at, it's already <coughs> so controversial and value-laden that it maybe it makes more sense, whereas if one's doing some of the more theoretical areas of biology and physics, people would be like, what in the world are you doing talking about your personal values and, and so on. So I think we need to think about the differences between different contexts yeah. and areas, but I appreciate your point. I think the public finds it refreshing when scientists are prepared to bring their knowledge, their expertise, to bear on a public controversy in a way that is genuine and honest. And um, so anyway, that's just sort of what I've been thinking. It's a question of kind of, usually the scientists don't get to frame this stuff in the first place. If it's a, if it's a con public controversy, they're kind of, you know what I mean? The framing is done by someone else. Yeah. So question, but I'm just an observation. Yeah, I mean, so, well, so your observations have, have, have made me think about, you know, two or three different things, and I'll have to see if I can remember all the things that, that struck me. I mean, one is, so, so your point about the framing being done by government or by industry or by environmental groups, um, I think that raises somewhat interestingly, potentially slightly different ethical questions about framing, because I sort of structured all this in terms of thinking about these norms associated with the scientific community and perhaps those helping the scientists to communicate. And so there I feel like there, you know, there is this sort of norm associated with a kind of objectivity and you know, also helping the public. And so I was trying to sort of navigate this potential tension. 
but it might be some of these other groups might not have the same kind of norm of objectivity um, that we associate with them. So we might just think, hey, you know, industry is just going to be framing things to their benefit. The environmental groups may be framing things in certain ways. So I think we would need to think more carefully about the norms associated with different kinds of entities, you know, what we're expecting from them, what our social sort of um, norms or, or standards are, and, and we might end up with a slightly different ethical story about what is and isn't appropriate use of frames in these different contexts. So that's, that's one thought that strikes me. Um, another point about the issue of people, the public really appreciating scientists, you know, actually coming out and, and, and sharing information. Um, so a couple of thoughts. One is, I've been struck, you know, I just joined this uh, Department of Fisheries and Wildlife at Michigan State, so I'm interacting more with scientists. And was very, very interesting talking to some of them and um, some folks today, actually, pointing out the way some of the scientists who are more willing to really get into science communication, um, maybe not the ones who are doing research and just share about it, but those who really move into a lot of science communication, their scientific colleagues can end up thinking, oh, well, they're just going into you know, science communication. They're not a real scientist anymore. And so um, I think there are dynamics of sort of how the scientists are perceived by their peers, even if the public is really appreciating what they're doing. But, and then and lastly, on that issue of how the public is perceiving what the scientists are saying, I agree. I think that there's tremendous value and appreciation for it. Um, but I think there's a difference. There are a few different ways the scientists could do that. One is, I think, my worry is too often the scientist says, okay, there is a 98% you know, chance this is going to happen, you know, according to my judgment, you know, and maybe give some you know, confidence interval or something like that, but may, maybe not do that when they're talking to the public. Or, um, anyway, and um, I think what you know, Dr. Bronson, Kelly, and I were, were sort of talking about is, should the scientists be saying, hey, this is my sort of sense of the issue, and I tend to be, you know, I'm concerned about public health or, you know, sort of my values are such that I'm, you know, concerned about environmental issues. And another scientist saying, you know, sort of as you hear these scientists, should the other scientists say, hey, this is, you know, the conclusion I came to and I've been a consultant for the forestry industry or, you know, that sort of thing. So it's this question of should they be trying to make these kinds of interests and values known or, or you know, something that, that sort of I lament that I would really appreciate more is scientists saying, okay, this is the position I'm taking. And this was frustrating for me on both sides of the endocrine disruptor controversy. Um, I maybe I, for those of you who aren't familiar with endocrine disrupting chemicals, it's the worry that a lot of chemicals may sort of mimic hormones and um, because our bodies are so sensitive to low levels of, of, of hormones that these endocrine disrupting chemicals, especially if we're exposed to them during development and so on, that they could really have worrisome effects at low, at low levels. Um, so that was the example I was talking about with the European Commission report. I felt like on both sides, you had some scientists who said, this European Commission report is crazy. And then you had other scientists who said, well, actually, the evidence is such that this is very reasonable. And, and neither they, they were both just sort of laying out positions as opposed to giving us a sense of sort of, well, what does the range of opinion within the scientific community look like? Or, you know, sort of why is there potential for difference of opinion? And sometimes that ends up coming out later. But I think that, um, I, so I'm, I'm a little, I'd, I'd like to see more of that, and that's part of the sort of the, the backtracking question. And so, and, and so I'm still slightly worried by, by Kelly's point that she was pushing on. I think it's an excellent point. You know, is it a good idea or not? Will the scientists totally lose their, their credibility? Will people just think they're wacky if they're saying, hey, I, I am sort of sympathetic to the environmental perspective, and, and that may have had something to do with my interpretation here. Um, will they lose all their credibility? So I don't know. I'm, there's still lots of questions for us to pursue and think about, and uh, you know, maybe some of you can have some good insights for me um, after we're done. Well, like in the case that you described, is a, a great case, bulls and sex, how could you go wrong with that? Uh, but just so like, even if everything else I said was silly, at least you like the case. We'll remember, we'll remember that. Um, but I'm wondering the degree to which it's possible that a, you know, the scientist that's doing the bull research uses the word monogamy purely as a descriptor of an empirical observation, right? But that, I mean, it's a loaded word. Like a whole lot of other people in society hear monogamy and they, they it's kind of a, from a philosophical perspective, it's a virtue. So, you know, just simple 
innocent adjective or something that we aspire to. And there's, there's all kinds of, I guess, problems where the, um, the scientists may be framing things he's not even intending to frame. Um, so that, that's one point. The other thing I think that's interesting, in a case like this, when, when things do get framed that way, I think what's almost more interesting is, uh, is what it says about this, you know, the society as much as it, what it says about science or the, the research that's going on. You know, that, that we would talk about bulls and sex and their monogamy and what it says about us wanting monogamy. I just sat on a, a dissertation uh, examining committee about, about Easter Island, Rapa Nui, and the, you know, the, all the controversy about whether it was sort of an imperialist uh, inspired collapse, you know, due to disease and so forth, or did they really sort of commit ecocide and overshoot their their resources and the scientists that are sort of arguing for the overshoot, you know, that without any European contact, they they uh, outstrip their resources. They want to tell that story so badly because it's such a powerful metaphor that they feel like we need to hear about, you know, because planet Earth is like a bigger version of Easter Island. And so I don't, I don't know, maybe you can comment on either one of those. Yeah. Um, actually, if I can, while I'm in Canada, sing the praises of a Canadian scholar. Um, there's a uh, environmental studies scholar, um, Brendan Larson, who is at the University of Waterloo, who published a really interesting book. I think it was called Metaphors for Environmental Sustainability. And he pointed out in the book all these ways in which you know, terminology from the environmental sciences and ecology, it's just like one term after another that comes from social context that has metaphorical aspects to it. I mean, all these terminologies like you know, um, communities and competition and you know, all this kind of stuff. Um, and, uh, and, and so his point was that it would be really valuable for the scientists to, you know, they use these terms, you know, not even thinking, and, and they may often have very precise, you know, mathematical definitions for the way they're using them, say, but to the extent that then this stuff is being communicated with members of the public, you know, other people are thinking about these in a whole variety of different ways. I mean, you know, one obvious example that comes up is discussion about invasive species and all the aspects to the idea of invasiveness and invasions and, you know, the aspects of, um, you know, the, 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 all the different things that some people might think of in terms of, uh, of that. And he says it really behooves the scientists to be a little bit more aware. And again, he's somebody who came from a scientific background, got interested in STS, and is now trying to sort of help his sort of former scientific colleagues to, to be a little bit more um, sort of perceptive about these, the, the dynamics of these terms they're using. And um, so I guess, I don't know if that's the greatest uh, answer to your, your question, but I guess I would just point out that I totally agree that this is another area where it would be to all of our benefit to be a little bit more, um, I don't know, just sophisticated in thinking about the ramifications of these terms that cross over between. And it's a fascinating example of how ideas from society, certain terms that are being used in a particular context, then make their way into the science and then have this sort of life in, in science and then make their way back into society. And so I think that language is a, is a, is a great way of highlighting some of these social connections between uh, you know, society and science. And,